sky. I understand power. All right, everybody. Happy Insurrection Day, I think is what people are saying today. It's January 6, 2024. And as the internet meme gag goes, we must solemnly remember the day that shall live in infamy. The day of the insurrection of January 6, 2021. Has it been three years already? You know, we say Happy Insurrection Day as a joke of sorts, you know, to make fun of those idiots who still refer to it as an insurrection, despite the fact that no one was was convicted of, let alone charged with insurrection, you don't need criminal accusations, you don't need criminal convictions in order to run with a lie, especially if you're Joe Biden. So they still call it an insurrection, despite all evidence to the contrary. And so the internet people out there are making fun of them, saying happy insurrection day, making light of the seriousness of that day, in my humble opinion, for one real reason. That day was in fact a dark day in American history. Not because of what those protesters did, those who got violent. I'm from Montreal people. I've seen more violence when you win or lose the Stanley Cup. Uh, the dark day of January 6th is not what the protesters did. It's what the government did and has since done as a result of January 6th or what they fabricated January 6th into becoming. There were pockets of violence. Nobody denies that. Insurrection, my ass, is what should be hashtagging today. The few pockets of violence. All right, shame on those people. Whether or not it was provoked by any number of the agents, agent provocateur in the crowd, we don't know how many there are because FBI, CIA won't confirm it, but we know there were lots because we know that the CIA, FBI, intelligence, whatever, had infiltrated the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys in their plot for seditious conspiracy in the weeks and months leading up to January 6th. So we know that intelligence knew allegedly what was going to go down on January 6th. And despite all of that, Yogananda Pittman, uh, Capitol Police authorities, Capitol Police were understaffed, did not call in the National Guard, did not ask for the National Guard to be called in, uh, did not take the basic proper precautions to prevent or protect against what they knew was coming because of their infiltration into the seditious conspiracy of terrorist organizations, at least if you're in Canada, of the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers. So, the, oh, there's a guy, the, oh my goodness, I'm being, I'm being, I'm being recorded as I vlog. Is he coming to say hi? So we know that the government knew what was coming down the pipe, what was potentially going to happen. They were circulating memos within the Capitol Police Force detailing the potential for violence, the plan for people to overthrow the government. We now know that they knew, and despite all of that, they fault Donald Trump for having not called in the National Guard, even though he lacked the requisite authority to do it, even though he offered to provide the National Guard at the request of the Capitol Police or the Capitol authorities who did not ask for it. We know what they did. The dark thing of what happened with January 6th is how they weaponized it into the most recent iteration of the Reichstag fire. It has been weaponized, it has been politicized, and it has been used and abused to demonize half of the population of America, to go after Trump, to try to get him off the ballot, to try to get him arrested, convicted, locked up, you know, because Joe Biden is all about democracy. He doesn't weaponize his own Department of Justice to go after his political rivals to try to lock them up because this isn't Russia or anything. That's part of the darkness of what January 6th was about. The other darkness of January 6th, what they did to some of the protesters out there. They needed people to die on January 6th. They needed people to die, even if it meant killing them themselves. And the they, I mean the deep state, the uni party, because I think there's as many Republican Congress people behind this as there are Democrats. Adam Kinzinger, Liz Cheney, I'm looking at you. The uni party, the deep state, the administrative state needed people to die if it meant killing them themselves. And when they needed people to die, what did they do? They ran with that bunk story about Brian Sicknick having been attacked and murdered by a mob of pro-Trump supporters. bald face lies from the day that they were reporting it. New York Times, I'm still looking at you because that article is still on the internet. bald face lies. Brian Sick smashed to death with a fire extinguisher, head trauma, head injuries. He dreamed of being a Capitol Police officer. Then he was murdered by a group of pro-Trump rioters. Lies. It ends up that he actually died of a stroke. Whether or not people want to make the argument that what happened on that day stressed out his system to the point where that's what was the under line cause of the stroke, you can make that argument. But he wasn't murdered. He wasn't killed. And he might have been exposed to some violence in as much as there were pockets of violence that day. I interviewed Tarek Johnson. There's no doubt there were pockets of violence. He was not murdered, but they needed people to die that day. And so what ended up happening? They executed one of them. Ashley Babbitt, former veteran 
Now, at the time of the protest, I was of the opinion, not that you play stupid games, you win stupid prizes, rather just you increase the likelihood of bad things happening to you when you do certain things. What's the guy's name? Steve Irwin. When he got killed by the Stingray, they say it's a one in a million chance, like running with a pencil and falling and having it stab you in the heart. One in a million, true. But when you do certain things, you sort of increase the odds or the frequency of that one in a million. And when you do certain things, you do increase the likelihood of bad things happening to you. That doesn't mean you deserved it. Ashley Bass it by going into the Capitol building, by partaking in the protests, especially when they did get violent, increase the likelihood of something bad happening to her. But in the realm of reality, you would think that you increase the likelihood of arrest, prosecution, etc. Not that you get executed point blank by a Capitol police officer. And that's what happened. And lo and behold, it came out yesterday or the day before the estate of Ashley Babbitt is suing the government for wrongful death, negligent discharge of a firearm, other damages. And uh, I'm going to walk through the highlights of that lawsuit. It's a good lawsuit. And as I read the allegations in that lawsuit, and bear in mind, they are just allegations. But as I read those allegations, and I know the reality, I've seen the video, I've talked to people, we all know what happened. As I read the allegations of that lawsuit, I become more and more enraged. Because now with the information that we have, with the knowledge that we have, with the videos that we have, with the testimonial evidence that we have now, and with the hindsight of the last three years of how they have weaponized what happened, I am now of the opinion that this was an extrajudicial execution of a citizen. They needed someone to die. They needed tragedy. They needed a death so they can pin it on Donald Trump. They needed someone to die that day, and that day it was Ashley Babbitt who had to take the bullet, literally. Estate of Ashley Babbitt and Aaron Babbitt individually and on behalf of the estate of Ashley Babbitt, plaintiffs versus the United States of America defendant. Complaint for assault and battery, negligence, negligent supervision, discipline and retention, negligent training, survival, and wrongful death. The estate of Ashley Babbitt and Aaron Babbitt individually and on behalf of the estate of Ashley Babbitt, herein referred to collectively as, quote, plaintiffs, end quote, by and through their attorneys of record, bring this complaint against the United States of America, defendant or United States, and allege as follows. I'm going to go through the lawsuit very quickly just to focus on the highlights. Ashley Babbitt had some administrative procedural stuff to go through before she could sue for wrongful death. They allege that early on in the lawsuit. Paragraph 6, plaintiffs have timely satisfied administrative exhaustion requirements by first presenting their claims to the United States Capitol Police, Capitol Police or USCP, within two years after such claims accrued, as required by 28 USC 2401 and 2675. Specifically, Ashley was shot and killed by a Capitol Police officer on January 6, 2021. Plaintiff's Standard Form 95 was presented to the Capitol Police Office of the General Counsel via fax on April 30, 2021, and via certified mail on May 7, 2021. And it goes on, but as Robert Barnes and I have discussed during multiple prior streams, there were some administrative requirements that the estate of Ashley Babbitt had to go through prior to making their claim. They've done that. They have gotten no formal response from the state, which basically results in a formal denial of the claim, and now they're sued. The Capitol Police has failed to make a final disposition of plaintiff's claims within six months after the claims were presented the failure to make a final determination may be and is deemed a final denial of plaintiff's claims. And then we get into the allegations of fact. These are allegations in the lawsuit, but by and large, people don't really disagree about what happened. There was a protest. There were a bunch of rioters, protesters in the building. Ashley Babbitt was trying to get through a window or looking like she was going to get through a window. She got shot point blank by an unclothed, plain clothed police officer. We know what happened as a matter of fact. There might be some disputed elements of fact, such as whether or not Ashley was warned. Minor facts. Bottom line, we we all know what happened. The only question is whether or not it was negligent, reckless, abusive, unwarranted, and therefore culpable or liability worthy in a civil suit. Paragraph 8. On January 6, 2021, at 2.44 p.m., Air Force veteran Ashley Babbitt, age 35, was shot and killed inside the U.S. Capitol by then Lieutenant Michael Byrd of the U.S. Capitol Police. The bullet pierced Ashley in her left anterior shoulder, perforated her left brachial plexus, trachea, upper lobe, and the right lung and second anterior rib, and landed in her right anterior shoulder. Ashley fell backwards and landed flat on her back on the marble floor. Video recordings show her alive and conscious, writhing uncontrollably immediately after the shooting. Paragraph 9, Ashley remained conscious for minutes or longer after being shot by Lieutenant Byrd. Ashley experienced extreme pain, suffering mental anguish, and intense fear before slipping into pre-terminal unconsciousness. The autopsy report identified the cause of death as a, quote, gunshot wound to the left anterior shoulder, end quote, with an onset interval of, quote, minutes, end quote. The fact that Ashley was alive and conscious in extreme pain and suffering is documented in videos of the shooting. Paragraph 14, the shooting occurred at the east entrance of the speaker's lobby. After demonstrators filled the hallway outside the lobby, two individuals in the crowd 
crowded, tightly packed hallway struck and dislodged the glass panels in the lobby doors and the right door side light. Lieutenant Byrd, who is a USCP commander and was the incident commander for the house on January 6, 2021, shot Ashley on site as she raised herself up into the opening of the right door side light. Lieutenant Byrd later confessed that he shot Ashley before seeing her hands or assessing her intentions or even identifying her as female. Ashley was unarmed. Her hands were up in the air, empty and in plain view of Lieutenant Byrd and other officers in the lobby. At the end of the paragraph, Lieutenant Byrd, who was not in uniform, did not identify himself as a police officer or otherwise make his presence known to Ashley. Lieutenant Byrd did not give Ashley any warnings or commands before shooting her dead. We then get into the various counts of liability. I'll go over some of those. Count one, assault and battery, intentionally shooting and killing of Ashley Babbitt by Lieutenant Byrd, estate of Ashley Babbitt. On January 6, 2021, Lieutenant Byrd, by his own admissions, intentionally shot Ashley with his firearm. At the time of the shooting, Lieutenant Byrd was an employee of the federal government acting within the scope of his employment with the USCP. Paragraph 30, when Lieutenant Byrd shot and killed Ashley on January 6, 2021, he breached multiple applicable standards of care governing A, the safe use of a firearm, B, the perception and assessment of imminent threats, C, use of force levels and escalation de-escalation of force, D, the perception and assessment of relevant facts, E, the use of warnings, F, firing backdrops, and G, obtaining timely appropriate medical aid among other breaches to be identified Hello. throughout discovery. What are you doing in here? Hello. Get out. All right, I've lost my uh, time to finish this vlog. I'll have to finish it at home. All right, we're at a Starbucks and the kids went to get a drink. So I'm going to finish this vlog while I wait for everyone to get out because the lineup is so long, it's ridiculous. It's a kid taking a nap in the back there. So the rest of the lawsuit goes through the alleged negligence of Bird, the Capitol Police officer. He works for the government, so they're going after his employer as well. And they detail all of the various errors of judgment, assessment of fact that Bird committed on that day. I'll go through a few of them just to illustrate it. At page 20, item J, Lieutenant Byrd erroneously believed he shot Ashley, quote, to save the lives of members of Congress and myself and my fellow officers, end quote, believing Ashley was, quote, a threat, end quote. A reasonably prudent officer in Lieutenant Byrd's position would have been aware that, in fact, Ashley was unarmed, small in stature, and did not pose a threat of imminent death or serious physical injury to Lieutenant Byrd or anyone else merely by climbing through the window. Lieutenant Byrd admitted, quote, I could not fully see her hands or what was in the backpack or what the intentions of, end quote. Quote, it was later, you know, I found out that the subject did not have a weapon, end quote, he added. And also just to fully steel man this lawsuit, one of the other allegations is that Lieutenant Byrd uh, committed an error of assessment of fact in that he thought he was barricaded in that area, in that room, when he in fact wasn't allegedly, according to the lawsuit, and he also thought that uh, there were many more Congress people that he was protecting by uh, murdering Ashley Babbitt. Uh, but apparently there weren't all that many, if any, members of Congress actually left in the room that he thought he was protecting. So a number of errors of fact committed by Lieutenant Byrd that led to him shooting Ashley Babbitt point blank in the upper torso. Negligent failure to warn. Paragraph 50, USCP Directive 1020.004 authorizes an officer to use lethal force to apprehend or prevent the escape of a fleeing felon when four conditions are met, including, quote, when practical, the officer identifies himself, herself, as a police officer and gives the subject a warning of the imminent use of lethal force, end quote. Paragraph 52, Lieutenant Byrd, who was not in uniform and was wearing a face mask, breached the standard of care, among other breaches to be identified throughout discovery, by A, failing to identify himself as an armed police officer, B, failure to give Ashley explicit verbal commands and warn her of the consequences of disobeying those commands, and C, failing to give Ashley an opportunity to comply with explicit verbal commands and warnings before he shot and killed her. Later on at paragraph 54, the lawsuit makes certain allegations as to the negligent firing into a crowd because what a lot of people don't really fully appreciate is that Bird, when he fired the shot at Ashley, had really no way of knowing that he wasn't going to hurt someone behind her, next to her. There were police officers behind Ashley Babbitt, but Bird, in all of his wisdom on that day, decided to summarily shoot and execute her in full negligent disregard of who he might have hit behind her or if that bullet ricocheted off a wall or floor or ceiling. Paragraph 54, negligent firing into a crowd. Under basic firearm safety rules, no target is so important that an officer cannot take the time before he pulls the trigger to be certain of his target and where his shot will stop if it 
misses the intended target or ricochets in another direction. Paragraph 55, under these basic safety rules, generally accepted police standards regulating the safe use of firearms and the duty to act as a reasonably prudent police officer, Lieutenant Byrd was required to make sure he knew who and what was behind Ashley before he pulled the trigger. Paragraph 76, quote, liability for negligent supervision arises when an employer knew or should have known its employee behaved in a dangerous or otherwise incompetent manner and that the employee, armed with that actual or constructive knowledge, failed to adequately supervise the employee, end quote. Paragraph 77, the Capitol Police, Capitol Police Board, and ultimately Congress, as Lieutenant Byrd's employers, knew or should have known that Lieutenant Byrd was prone to behave in a dangerous or otherwise incompetent manner and owed Ashley a duty to use reasonable care in supervising, disciplining, and retaining Lieutenant Byrd. Paragraph 101, as a direct and proximate result of the assault, battery, negligence, negligent supervision, discipline, and retention, and negligent training of defendant United States and its employees, while acting within the scope of their office or employment, as alleged in this complaint, plaintiff Aaron Babbitt, Ashley spouse suffered damages, including his own pain, suffering, and emotional distress, loss of Ashley's services and companionship, loss of Ashley's projected future income, and other damages cognizable under the District of Columbia's Wrongful Death Act. And there you have it, the estate of Ashley Babbitt's wrongful death lawsuit against the United States government. May they succeed and may there be some. There can never be justice at the end of the day, but there can be compensation for the damages, although it will never be whole because they took Ashley Babbitt's life that day. There are lefties out there saying she got what she deserved. This was shooting an unarmed woman point blank, but they needed a death that day. They got a death that day, and they tried to pin the death of Ashley Babbitt at the hands of Lieutenant Byrd on Donald Trump. How sick and demented can you possibly get? So so in a very real sense, happy Insurrection Day to everyone out there. Understand what they did with that day. Understand what they allowed to happen, what they facilitated to happen, and what they might have actually participated in causing to happen so they could exploit it for the next three years. Understand what happened that day. And when we go out there and say happy Insurrection Day, understand it is a critique of the government. One day, people will be held accountable for what they did. One day, we're not yet there yet, but we'll get there one day. Politically, legally, people will be held to account. And with that said, if you like my videos, you know what to do. Like, share, subscribe, hit the notification bell, drop a All that stuff, more important than anything, get out there, talk to friends and neighbors, talk to other people. The Great Awakening is upon us. And now you know your vlog. Peace. Booyah! Since that day, more than 1,200 people have been charged for their assault on the Capitol. Nearly 900 of them have been convicted or pled guilty. Collectively, to date, they have been sentenced to more than 840 years in prison.